Hello, my name is Alex Rodoa, and today I'll be talking about liquid and gas chromatography mass spectrometry method development for the quantification of per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances in environmental matrices. Before we really start to dive in, I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity uh, to grab that contact information. So if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out. Um, so I'm right here at the top, Alex Rodoa. I have also listed uh, two of my collaborators, Jessica Reiner and Benjamin Place, who are also at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So a little bit of background about me. So I am currently a um, NRC postdoc with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. I started my postdoc in November of 2019 in Charleston, South Carolina in the Biochemical and Exposure Sciences Group. Um, so currently I'm working on PFAS, which we're going to be talking about extensively today and expanding the knowledge that we currently have at NIST. Um, so we, I will be expanding the PFAS methodology and then working on reference material production and quantitative analysis of materials. And so we'll be talking about all of those things and you'll get a little bit more background. Before that, I did my PhD at Oregon State University, also in PFAS, is, PFAS is in different environmental um, matrices. So I've said the word PFAS a lot, um, so <laughs> let's dive in. Tell me about PFAS. Um, so there are a couple important things that I really like to mention early on in the presentation for those of you that don't know what PFAS are. So firstly, they're from anthropogenic origin. So PFAS, when we see them in the environment, are a direct result of human use and disposal. Um, and we only see them because they're man-made and not naturally occurring products. We play them in numerous sectors, which is why we see them in the environment so commonly. So the sectors include consumer products, manufacturing processes, and in aqueous film forming foams for the suppression of hydrocarbon-based fuel fires. We'll talk about that a little bit today, but if you want any more information, feel free to reach out. Again, important to remember, there are potentially thousands of PFAS, and that's a result of proprietary mixtures and impure chemistries. So let's talk about those chemistries a little bit more. Okay, so here are the things that make PFAS a PFAS. So firstly, they have a carbon fluorine chain. So the carbon fluorine chain can vary in length, um, as you can see. So they can go from two all the way up to about 22. Um, of course, there are some odd exceptions here and there. Um, so you can see there could be a number of different uh, chain lengths, and so that would can count as an individual PFAS. The other thing we have to consider is that all of these uh, carbon fluorine chain lengths may have different appearances. So right here in the middle, you see there could be linear, which is also what I've shown over here on the left. There could also be branch PFAS isomers. And so what that means is that the um, molecular weight of the molecule is the same, but they are slightly smaller surface area. Um, and that's going to come up a little bit later in one of our chromatographic slides. So we've got the branched and linear, we've got this carbon fluorine chain link. So the, that is shared by all PFAS. The thing that can vary in a PFAS is that polar head group. And so over here on the right, I've shown different examples of what polar head groups can look like. Um, so each of these polar head groups typically have a distribution of chain links associated with them. And so you can see how this problem is sort of multiplying, right? So we have tons and tons of different PFASs. Um, the polar head group may vary, the chain links may vary, and it all sort of contributes to uh, the PFAS problem. So I wanted to, um, just for the purposes of this uh, presentation, give you a bit of a better representation. So the carbon fluorine chain, or the carbon fluorine bond in the environment is one of the strongest in nature. And so it's very hard to degrade, it's very hard to break down. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna imagine it's like a steel chain. So it's very hard to move, it's hard to break, it doesn't wanna interact with other things. Um, but then that polar head group is gonna act as an interactive surface. And so it's going to sort of interact with any material you put it up against. It's actually hydrophilic, um, whereas the carbon fluorine chain is hydrophobic. So these chemicals have very unique properties in the environment, and they are in lots of different sectors. So let's talk about how they end up in the environment and how they're all connected. So we put together a nice little web. This is not all inclusive. So there are certainly different little offshoots here. So I've just sort of um, broken it down in simplistic terms. So firstly, we have manufacturing. Manufacturing can include just making the PFAS, but also using and manufacturing processes, such as chrome plating for misoppression. Um, the other place we're gonna go once we've manufactured is consumer products. So the next time you go to buy a waterproof jacket or a stain resistant shirt, know that you're probably purchasing PFAS. Um, when we wash these products, 
typically, um, they'll go, <laughs> there is the potential that PFAS could be washed off. They go into the wastewater stream in the form of gray water, and then they're transported to your local wastewater treatment plant. Once they reach your wastewater treatment plant, PFAS tend to distribute both into the biosolids and into, they stay in the, in the water. Um, so just a, a stop point here. So the biosolids have the potential um, at a certain point to be distributed to the landfill. So we have a little bit of crosstalk between landfills and wastewater treatment plants. Um, so just something to keep in mind. But then that finished effluent may have PFAS in them uh, or in it. And so the PFAS may be distributed to the groundwater, surface water, and drinking water. And we're going to talk about that, that sort of end point here in just a second. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind. So back to our consumer products, we wash them, we love them, they end up at the wastewater treatment plant. And then at the end of the garment's life or the product's life, we'll throw them away. So once they hit the landfill, um, that the landfill is actually serving as an aggregate for PFAS. But we also have to keep in mind that there is a liquid content typically associated with landfill. And as that percolates down, that's called landfill leachate. And that distributes at the bottom, it's then collected. And in some cases, it's recirculated um, because it's full of good microbial growth. And so it's going to help break down things further in the landfill. Alternatively, that landfill leachate is taken directly to the wastewater treatment plant, where it is bled into the wastewater treatment plant stream. So you can see there's lots of crosstalk between these two sources. Um, and in that way, so we could have the landfill leachate that's bled into the wastewater treatment plant or potentially leaks in the landfills. Um, and that could be contributing to groundwater, surface water, and drinking water contamination of PFAS. Um, so our other major source is going to be aqueous film forming foam application and use. Uh, so this is actually a photo out of a naval ship. And so they're very specialized products. They're for hydrocarbon-based fuels and in some cases, polar solvent fires. Um, they're not going to be your common everyday uh, aqueous foam forming foam um, uses, but they are going to be used for specific purposes. So there's plane crash, there's a train crash. And so of course we use AFFF to put out a fire quickly and um, there, that's a specific event. But the other thing we have to consider is fire training areas. So historically we've needed to train our firefighters, right? How to use these products. And so with fire training areas, typically what will happen, historically, there was a lined pit, you would add fuel, you would put the fire out with the AFFF, and that AFFF was uncontained, and so it would percolate down into the groundwater or the surface water, where it has the potential to impact drinking water. Of course, once we realized this was truly uh, an environmental issue, uh, new measures have been taken where a lot of that um, product will be removed and actually plumbed over to your local wastewater treatment plant. Um, so something to keep in mind, of course, there's lots of crosstalk and we have um, environmental distribution of PFAS coming from different sources. So just to give you a little bit, little bit of context. Okay, so you'll notice I kept talking about drinking water. Okay, so there is some regulation for PFAS in the United States. So there are currently, a, there is a health advisory limit set by the US EPA of 70 nanograms per liter for PFAS and PFOA or a combination of the two. Typically we see these, these two chemicals co-occur. Um, so the likelihood is it's going to be a summation of PFAS and PFOA and not one or the other, although those cases do exist. Um, so you can see the chemical structures over here for those of you that are interested on the right hand side. Um, so PFOA has a carbon fluorine chain length of seven and PFOS has a carbon chain length of eight. The reason that cutoff was set is because that is typically where we see um, negative bioaccumulation happening um, and potentially health effects. So you'll note that these are health advisory limits and they're in drinking water only. So we're gonna talk about that in just a second. But it, here, it's really important to remember that these are health advisory limits and not maximum contaminant levels, which means that they're not enforceable. So this is because they were set on non-cancer endpoints, um, including reduced birth weight in PFOS and developmental effects in bones and accelerated puberty in PFOA. Um, however, I should note that there is increasing interest at state and federal levels. And so those limits or those uh, the health advisory limits may be variable depending on your state. So I highly recommend if you're interested to go look at your state's uh, legislature and find out what the health advisory um, limit is. Okay, so we talked more about drinking water and so how impacted is our drinking water? So we know right now that drinking water is a huge exposure vector to PFOS and PFOA and PFAS in general. Um, so if you are a member of the general public, typically your largest exposure is going to be drinking water. Um, as part of the US EPA uh, third unregulated contaminant monitoring rule program, which is always one of my favorite examples, uh, we've actually included six PFAS 
so including PFOS and PFOA, which are those health advisory limit chemicals. Um, and they found that roughly 6 million people in the U.S. exceeded that EPA health advisory of 70 nanograms per liter. And they found further, if you lived within a military watershed, you had a 10 to 35 percent increased risk to exposure. Uh, so something sort of to keep in mind, we want to protect our natural resources. And how do we do that? We have to think about, you know, good measurements and how to uh, effectively measure them. I'm just going to point out over here on the right, there is a, a fabulous website called the Environmental Working Group. I highly recommend you check that out. It's actually an interactive map that's full of contamination. So when there has been um, measurements made, they'll be posted to this website. You can sort of hover over so you can look at your local area. I always think it's pretty fancy and recommend you check it out. Okay, so we know there is regulation. We know that there is potential contamination. And so this is where NIST steps in. Um, so NIST is the North American Metrology Institute, uh, which is where I'm currently doing my postdoc, and NIST is responsible for standard reference materials. So standard reference materials are used for a number of different reasons, including to calibrate a measurement system, to establish traceability of measurements, to validate an analytical system, and to provide quality control of measurements. So you can see over here uh, some pictures on the right of different SRM materials, the standard reference material. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that um, and sort of my journey to being able to quantitatively measure uh, standard reference materials for PFAS. Um, if you're interested a little bit more in how SRMs have been used historically, uh, Jessica Reiner and I published a paper earlier this year. Uh, you can see the the little crop of it down here in the left hand corner. Um, but it, it is a case study looking at how uh, the environmental community has used a standard reference material in their measurements. Um, so if you're interested and uh, you'd like to follow up, feel free to reach out to any of us or check out that paper first. Okay, so specifically at NIST, um, we currently have 10 standard reference material with measured PFAS in them. Uh, so you can see the list here. We've got some fish tissues, some human serum, house dust, soil, domestic sludge, and uh, just neat materials in methanol. If you're interested, go ahead and follow that link there, and you can look into what measurements have been made and what they are. So ultimately, the, the benefit of a NIST SRM is you know what the concentration is, and you know what the matrix is. So it's helping provide a better calibration measure um, to increase the quality of the measurements we make. Okay, so talking a little bit more about those materials, uh, I wanted to sort of take everyone through a journey of my experience at NIST. Um, so as I, I sort of talked about earlier, I started in PFAS and I had the opportunity when I moved to NIST to start working on a new PFAS methodology or a few new PFAS methodology, one for liquid chromatography mass spectrometry and one for gas chromatography mass spectrometry. So the later part of this talk is going to be discussing everything that uh, I've sort of gone through to optimize. So thinking first about our materials, um, I wanted to give you an example. So this is going to be a graphic example and then I'll give you uh, just a visual picture of how PFAS works just to give you a little bit more of an idea how they interact with the surface. Okay, so imagine this is your lovely material. This could be paper, textile, could be food contact material, a waterproof jacket. Um, and so as we sort of talked about, there was, is that um, big chain that doesn't want to interact. Okay, so I talked about how PFAS and that carbon fluorine chain are hydrophobic, they're oleophobic, water and oil repellent. They don't want to interact with anything. So those carbon fluorine tails are actually going to stick straight up off of the surface. Keeping in mind here, there could be a linear and branched isomers, as I mentioned before, attached to the surface. And then that polar head group that's going to interact with the surface. And so that polar head group is actually going to bind to the material. And this is how like a Teflon pan works or your waterproof jacket. So we've got these carbon fluorine chains sticking up and the polar head group attached to the surface. So when water and oil are present, they don't, they try and uh, get repelled by the carbon fluorine chain and the water and oil bounces right off. So that's why that's so effective. Just to give you a visual representation, so this is a material that has one side coated in PFAS. So on the bottom, so this is the side chain fluoropolymer. We know that it's made of PTFE. Um, so down here on the bottom picture, you can see or can't see. Um, I actually sprayed a bit of water on that side. And so you can see it just sort of like blobs out. And so you don't get a lot of definition of where the water is. 
However, on the PFAS coated side, it's got all those carbon fluorine chains sticking up. And so what you get is that water that really tries to just interact with itself to get away from those carbon fluorine chains because the carbon fluorine chains are repelling the water. Um, so I thought that was a great visual representation. It's always one of my favorite and hopefully it helps you to sort of put PFAS into perspective. Okay, so we have our material. The first thing we need to do is extract the material. So this is a very brief uh, overview. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. There are lots of people doing amazing work with all of these different matrices. Um, I covered just a couple different ways that PFAS can be extracted. So a typical extraction could consist of solid phase extraction. So you would do isotope dilution here in the first step. You would add in your solid phase extraction attached to an SDE manifold and elute it. You may blow it down to concentrate uh, the PFAS material in there, and then you would transfer it to an auto sampler vial for analysis. The alternative, you could do a dilution series where you would take an, a small aliquot out of your bottle, you would add internal standards, and you would put that directly in your auto sampler vial. So depending on the concentration, it has to be fit for purpose. Uh, there are, of course, other, tons of other types of um, extractions, including liquid, liquid extraction and other, um, which could encompass really anything your heart sort of desires. Um, so here's just one example. Um, again, I'm going to talk about our, our nice little material. Um, so imagine that we've got that down to the surface again. Now I'm going to add solvent and carry away what is miscible. So just to put that for you one more time, and it carries it away. So what we're interested in is really what is coming off of materials or coming through materials through the extraction pro process and could potentially be available for exposure to humans. Okay, so now we've extracted our material, we put it in an auto sampler vial, and now we have to run it through an analytical method. So this is sort of the fun part for me. I love method development. So that's what I'll be talking about today. So we're first gonna start with liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. Um, I got started here at NIST, as I mentioned in November, in about February, I was given access to an instrument, instrument and able to divide, um, to develop my PFAS method. So the first thing I had to think about was what analytes did I want to include? So because LCMSMS is a targeted approach, meaning that I have to tell the instrument specifically what to look for, I needed to know what to look for. So this uh, included a large literature dive and relying on previous knowledge to select the analytes of interest. So I say fit for purpose because uh, if you were looking for an AFFF source versus a groundwater source versus a consumer product, you may actually look for different PFAS in the environment. Um, so something to keep in mind, make sure that the analytes you're selecting are ones that are specific to your matrix. Um, so the next thing I did is I went out into uh, the great world and I um, purchased standard reference materials, or I'm sorry, not standard reference materials, commercially available standard materials that um, are just pure PFAS. So there are many different sources, including Wellington, uh, TCI, lots of different places, and they all sell different products. So I purchased from there, they're neat materials, and then I had to infuse those materials. So the purpose behind this is to optimize in the instrument. So the mass spec is trying to look for these chemicals and you wanna make sure that when it's looking for that little snapshot, it can see everything it possibly can see to the best of its ability. So this could be things like um, depolarization energy, exit potential, collision energies, collision voltages. Um, so it's all gonna be very dependent on the instrumentation. So I've listed my parameters here, um, but it may, it's of course going to vary instrument to instrument. So the other thing I did was optimize sort of, I'm calling it at the macro scale, which is not the correct language by any means, but it's the overall parameters that are set forth by the instrument that impact the entire method. So it's not analyte specific, but it's method specific. And so that's this table over here on the right. So the example of instrument ionization or optimization, I apologize. Um, so, okay, now my mass spec is tuned. It's super happy. It can see everything, hopefully, that it's looking for. Um, the next thing we're going to have to do is separate out of our samples. And so we're going to do that by selecting an analytical column. So uh, over here on the left, I have sort of a step-by-step step by step of, step step of things that I needed to purchase in order to build my analytical method. Of course, everyone has different opinions. Go ahead and take a look in the literature. People have lots of different ideas on what columns and things to use. Um, I'm just going to briefly talk about a few things that I found very useful and products that uh, I tended to use so that we can compare later on. Uh, so the first thing was an analytical holdup column. So I purchased an Eclipse Plus C18. Essentially what this does is this goes after, goes after your purge valve and it's going to 
filter out all the PFAS that may be coming from upstream of your sample, so that are resident in the liquid chromatography side of things, so on your LC stack. Um, typically, because PFAS are in everything, they're in seals, they're in uh, your degassers, they're in a couple different places. I've seen this to be especially prevalent if it's a new instrument, um, you may have background contamination. So rather than uh, artificially inflating your uh, concentration so you get out of your sample, um, you can put on this delay column and what it will do is shift your contamination to slightly later in your analytical run so that there is separation between your peak and your con and your contamination peak. Um, so it's kind of important, it's very important for uh, this method and I highly encourage that you use it. Um, something that's sort of optional, but I've gotten a lot of value out of um, is an analytical guard cartridge. So I selected a Zorbax dial, uh, depending, again, this is fit for purpose. So I have a sort of weak link in my methodology. And so that's PSBA, so that's that short chain carboxylic acid C4, um, which we're gonna talk about here in two slides. Um, but I wanted to include that dial here, um, specifically for sort of my, my problem children of the analytical methodology. So the last thing you're going to need, and perhaps the most important, is going to be your actual analytical column. So you'll notice here I've listed three different ones. So a C18, a PFP, and a phenylhexyl column. Um, so these are all analytical columns that can perform the uh, chromatographic separation that we may need. Um, the next thing you're going to do once you've purchased your column is going to be set up an analytical gradient and choose a mobile phase. Um, so here I've listed an example of what I use and then the gradient over here on the right. So you'll notice that the gradient varies slightly depending on the column. And so that's just to get the chromatographic separation that I, I'm desiring. And so this was the final methodology. Of course, there was some tweaking um, that I sort of went through as I was developing these methods. And feel free to uh, use this, try it out, um, shoot me an email if you have any questions. But OK, so we run uh, standard now. We're going to have a mixture. I actually had a mixture of 34 individual PFAS analytes. Uh, I injected them into my instrumentation using just solution at 15 nanograms per mil in methanol. Um, and so you'll see the different configurations. So I used the Zorbax dial on all three of my different methods with varying uh, analytical columns. So over here on the left is the C18 configuration, the phenylhexyl configuration, and the PFP configuration. You'll notice there's there's peaks, which is great, um, but we need to dig in a little bit more. So what you're looking at is the total ion chromatogram. It's representing all of the peaks that are eluding and being collected by the mass spectrometer, but they're not super helpful for selectivity because we can't see everything individually quite yet. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Um, first, we need to compare our chroma chromatography across our different analytical columns. So on the left-hand side, you can see the three different configurations. So there is the C18, the funnel hexyl, and the PFP. So as I mentioned, PFBA is one of the trickier ones because it's so small, um, relatively speaking, uh, molecular weight-wise. It tends to slip through an analytical column more quickly. There's less, there less good retention. Um, and so what you'll end up with is variable peak shapes. So you'll notice uh, A and C here, nice and Gaussian peak shapes. That's sort of what we would expect. And in B, which is the final hexyl, you see a little bit of tailing. So of course, it's acceptable, but it's not perfect. And we're aiming for perfection here. So um, right now, my contenders, I'm thinking, would be A or C. So that's C18 or the uh, PSP column. So then let's pick a different analyte. So something else that's going to be kind of troublesome and we want to make sure is included in our chromatography. And so that's the branched and linear isomers. As I sort of talked about earlier, they have a smaller um, overall size because of that branching. And so that's represented here chromatographically as this uh, earlier uh, sort of hump on the um, front end of our chromatography. They move through the system slightly faster and so they elute sooner. Um, in current methods, we want to quantify both branched and linear, but we like to have that branched and linear separation. So that was something I was looking for when I was creating this method. Uh, you'll notice here in A, we get nice resolution between branched and linear. Um, so we're liking the looks of that so far. In B, with the funnel hexyl, there is separation, but it's not baseline resolved. And so I say baseline resolved is there are two individual peaks between the branched and the linear. We didn't quite get that. It's still, it's not bad, but it could be better. Um, and then with C, we had actually either more separation um, or not perfect resolution between the branch and linear. And so for that reason, I ended up selecting 
the dial connected to that C18 column. And feel free to grab that information. I really like this column. It's been very stable. I've run probably 1,500 samples on it at this point, and it's still going strong. Okay, so the last thing we have to do, we finalize our method, we're happy with our chromatography, we're happy with our optimization. The last thing we do is we put it into action. Um, so below, I sort of described an experiment where I was evaluating different bulk sorbent phases um, for efficiency in sorbing PFAS from synthetic groundwater. So you'll notice um, the measurements are very close to one another, those RSV values are quite low. So the reason for that, we are the Metrology Institute. So all of our measurements are made gravimetrically, which means that there's reduced error um, versus doing things volumetrically. So something to consider, but uh, we were quite happy with the results. You'll notice here actually, so PFBA, which we know is our sort of problem child, um, that we didn't get good retention. Um, so the concentration is below my reporting limit. And the reason for that is, is actually the sorbent and not the analytical method. We know that because we could just see it with our analytical description. Uh, so something to keep in mind, just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's a problem with your analytical setup. You want to validate your analytical setup um, before you sort of dive into your sample. Okay, so we've gone through the liquid chromatography side. Now let's briefly talk about gas chromatography. So gas chromatography was new to me. I was really excited about it. Um, so I'm going to sort of walk you through the steps of developing a, developing a method here. So the big difference between LC analytes and GC analytes are going to be how generally how volatile they are in the environment. Um, so the more volatile analytes are going to be uh, preferentially selected for GC, whereas the ionic or less volatile analytes are going to be selected for LCMSMS. There is a little bit of cross talk between the two of those, uh, but I'm not going to discuss that really today. So again, we have to start at the beginning. So what analytes do we want to include? Um, so we one, want to make sure that we're selecting the correct analytes, so the volatile analytes, and ones that are appropriate for our matrix, so something to keep in mind. Okay, so gas chromatography versus liquid chromatography, we're going to be starting things a little bit differently. Because there is no way to infuse, we first have to purchase a column and get separation. So the way I did that was I went into the literature, I talked to lots of people who are GC experts, and I selected some columns. So in this case, I again have a guard column, and that's just going to be for analytical separation, um, a connector between the two, and then an analytical column. So I actually selected an RTX VMS column from ResTech. Uh, it's a great column. I've really enjoyed it so far. Um, it is a proprietary blend, but I suspect it primarily works off of hydrophobicity, which is going to be to our benefit here, and we'll discuss that in a second. Um, but so now we have our analytical column. The important thing that we need to know is the boiling point of our analytes. So I mentioned hydrophobicity. Um, and the reason for that is most of the elution is going to be a result of boiling point plus the interaction with the stationary phase in your analytical column. So to start and to get that initial uh, chromatographic separation, I wanted to go uh, slow and steady. And so I did that by creating a very slow ramp um, all the way up to the maximum of my column where I held it just to get off any extra contaminants that could be in there. So over here on the right, you can see the representation of my um, method, my uh, temperature gradient. Okay, so we've run our low and slow method and now, um, using analytical standards, we're going to set up a SIM scan method, which is uh, the selection that you would put in your graph, uh, your GCMS. And we want to include the M over Z range of your analyte. So we need to, again, it's targeted, so we need to make sure that we know what we're looking for. Um, then we're going to identify ions and build a SIM method for the most abundant ions. Um, and so I've, cre I've um, included a picture over here on the right, but it's kind of hard to see. So let's dive in a little bit more, see what I mean by that. So I've taken an example, which is the, this is the H2 fluorotelomer alcohol or FTO um, in SIM scan mode. So I've included my, uh, my total ion chromatogram scan with my M over Z that was including the H2 FTO range. And you see we've got a nice peak here. So if I scroll over that peak and I look at the spectra that's coming off of it, you'll see all of these little peaks. And so these are the ions that I'm going to select and test for inclusion in my methodology. Okay, so you'll notice that there are some sort of smaller peaks over here on the uh, higher mass M over Z range, mass to charge uh, over on the, I'm sorry, on the right. However, on the lower end, you get higher abundance, but less selectivity. So the reason for that is because this is uh, typically more of a hard ionization technique. Um, you're going to get more uh, mass over on the left side at the lower range. 
So we're going to include mostly the high-end mass range, but uh, not going to completely include or exclude our low-end mass range. This is just something to keep in mind. Okay, so now I've selected my ions that are directly related to my H2 FTO. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to build a SIM MRM method with those specific ions. And I'm going to try and select the most abundant ions. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, so you'll notice that 445, the 406, and 464 were all in my uh, selected ions uh, off of our H2 FTO example from a few slides ago. And now I ran them, I looked at the total abundance. So you'll see that 445 was selected as my quantitative ion because it's the most abundant, 406 is my qualitative ion because it's slightly less abundant, and 464 was actually emitted from the method because it's less abundant. Um, so it would be a good backup in case my 406 or 445 end up having a uh, interference that's coming out of our matrix. Okay, so the, one of the last things we need to do is adjust our analytical temperature gradient uh, for our desired chromatographic separation. Um, so over here we have the 4 to 2, 5 to 2 F2, and that's on the left-hand side in our first window. And so what I, I had a bit of trouble resolving between the two because they are quite uh, close in molecular weight. And so I separated them out a bit using just a hold, so this purple line on the or the temperature gradient. And then uh, you'll notice the 6 and the 7 to 2, I created sort of a slow ramp right there at the beginning um, just to get that nice separation. So something to keep in mind, even though we are selecting for the specific ion. Last thing we need to do is define our windows for increased sensitivity. So you can see these little gray bars with the arrows. So those are my individual windows. This just helps to uh, weed out the noise uh, and reduce the amount of scans that the instrument is doing per second. So the last thing we have to do now that we have our happy method is to apply the method. Um, I'm currently in the process of extracting SRM materials and uh, I'll have more data for you soon. And with that, I just wanted to wrap up. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Feel free to reach out if you have any additional questions.